Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the seminar series uh, hosted by the Australian Citizen Science Association's Early and Mid-Career uh, Researcher Working Group. Um, my name is Pat Bonney. Uh, I'm coming to you from Lake Tyres uh, in East Gippsland, which is the traditional lands of the Gunai Kurnai people. Uh, I acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai as the traditional owners of this land and waters of this country and uh, pay my respects to their elders um, past, present and emerging. Um, and it's great to see some uh, familiar faces here today, um, but for those who are joining us for the first time, um, welcome uh, to, to the seminar series. Feel free to use the chat, uh, introduce yourselves, uh, let us know where you're coming from today. Um, so about these seminar series, uh, they were initially set up to provide a space for citizen science researchers to, to share their research with others. And, and so far we've heard from some, you know, fantastic researchers looking into uh, relationships between citizen science and environmental policy, genomics research, uh, digital technologies and uh, environmental activism as well. Um, and so just a, a general structure for today too. So we'll hear from our presenter, Anna Christie, um, who's going to be speaking about the, the challenges uh, and opportunities of citizen science monitoring of, of coal mines and gas fields. Uh, this will be followed by a Q&A. Um, about Anna's research. So please drop in your questions into the chat and we'll be sure to, to relay those to, to Anna at the end of the presentation. Um, and following this Q&A, we'd like to open up uh, the conversation uh, in a group discussion, which will be will hosted by my, uh, my colleague and collaborator on this seminar series, uh, Dr. Yala Golombic. Um, so with that, uh, with that short introduction, I'd like to introduce uh, Anna Christie. Um, Anna is studying a PhD in Science and Law at Western, University, uh, Western Sydney University. Uh, she's pre previously worked in the public and private sectors, in environmental projects around developing and establishing green waste and chemical collection systems. Uh, she also lectures uh, in environmental communications and environmental values and ethics at Australian uh, Catholic University, uh, and is also involved in a range of different projects at University of Sydney, University of New South Wales, and the University of Technology, Sydney's Institute of Sustainable Futures. Uh, since 2014, Anna has conducted tours of the Lerd and, and Pillager, I hope I'm getting that right, Pillager forests, connecting visitors and students uh, with these inland forests and uh, raising awareness of the impacts of coal and coal seam gas mining. So thanks for coming again. Uh, looking forward to this presentation. Uh, and I'd like to hand it over to, to Anna uh, to, to present um, today. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Pat. And I hope you can see and hear me okay. Um, am I coming through okay to you, Pat? Yes, Anna, that's all good. Good, excellent. Well, thanks everyone for coming along um, today. And um, this is the culmination of several years of hard work. And it's, it's not my work. This is a collective that, we, that has come together in the northwest of New South Wales and um, we, we operate on the land of the Gomeroy, um, also known as the Gamilaray. And uh, the, this area is known as the Namoy River Valley to some. To others, it's known as the Surat Basin. That's the geological name, which some people prefer to, to call it to bring attention to the incredible uh, amount of fossil fuels that lies beneath the ground. Um, we prefer to keep attention on the river valley side of it because that's the water and that's one of the hugest concerns that exists today um, in relation to the, um, the incoming heavy industry from coal and gas. Um, so, I wish to offer my respects to the Gomorrah people. They continue to fight to protect their ancestral lands. And this battle is going on today um, against multi-billion dollar companies who seek to come into these greenfield areas and to uh, divide and conquer so that they can gain what they think is a form of social license to, to conduct this kind of industry there. Um, the Laird Forest Research Node was established in 2015 following the expansion of the Bogabri coal mine and the commencement of the Malls Creek coal mine in the Laird Forest. We are not associated with a particular university and we are a, a collective, we're a node. Um, we, 
we operate according to um, some uh, procedures and transparent um, uh, sharing of information wherever possible. Um, but we have been fairly organic in our um, establishment. So um, what I thought I'd do is before we go into more details about the, the risks and the opportunities, I'm going to show a slideshow. I'm going to put up my... Um, I'm going to put up my uh, slideshow now, and I hope that that is clear to everyone to have a look. This is our little logo. When we originally started, we were concerned that there wasn't enough attention being paid on evidence. Um, there was a highly, highly um, uh, conflicted situation going on in the, um, the area of the Laird Forest, and... Um, uh, citizen science has now become a necessary form of community action when confronted with coal and gas extraction. And with the advent of mega coal mines like Malls Creek and a proliferation of other coal mines, both open cut and underground, it's exposed residents to ongoing environmental impacts and loss of amenity, potential health concerns due to excessive pollution. Um, here's a list of the um, coal mines that we've got in the area. And in fact, I've got a map here that shows them to you. But look, we've got the um, Narrabri Underground Mine, Malls Creek Mine, that's a 13 million tonnes per annum, Bogabri Mine, so that's the only coal mine that's not owned and operated by Whitehaven, um, Tarawonga, Rock Glen and Vickery. Um, we've also got on the doorstep the Narrabri Gas Project, which has been approved, and we've also got pending, announced only a matter of weeks ago, that the New South Wales government is opening up more areas of New South Wales for gas exploration, and incredibly, they're opening up the Liverpool Plains, which is said to be some of the most, not only the most fertile land in Australia, but even recognised internationally as being of higher fertility. And this is our food bowl. Now, just to show you where the area is that we're looking at, if you look on the map, you'll see um, a red area, and that's, that's the Namoy River catchment. Here, I'll just... I don't know if, if you can see, but here we've got the Narrabri Gas Project over to the southwest of Narrabri. Here's the Narrabri town. I'm just using my cursor to show people um, if you can see where that is. Um, we've got here the Narrabri Underground Mine, just near the Camilleroy Highway, Malls Creek, Mega Mine, Bogabri, Tarawonga. These three are referred to as, well, they originally were referred to as the Laird Mining Precinct, but now, they ditched that name because there's an, a move towards like not actually talking about the lead. Even Google Earth got rid of the label lead forest, which we don't know how that happened. Um, they're now called it the, um, the BTM mine complex. <laughs> so you see how language can play a role. It went from being the lead forest to now being called the BTM mine complex. Here we have the Vickery Mine. This one is currently the subject of um, a, um, uh, a federal court legal action by a number of young Australians who, have who took the, um, the federal environment minister, Susan Lay, to court, um, claiming that she breached her duty of care to the, basically to people who will be alive in the second half of this century. Um, and they said that she's that she has breached her duty of care by um, by giving a, if she gives approval to the Vickery mine. And then we've got two other smaller mines there as well. Down here at the bottom is Werris Creek, another highly problematic mine operated by Whitehaven Coal. Here, I just wanted to give you a, a look at the diagram of the, uh, the this is the gas fields now. Um, this dark area here is what is now known to be the extent of Santos's stage one and probably stage two. If they get it, if they go ahead, um, just I'll flick back to show you where that is. So that um, gas field map, it kind of goes sort of around this area down to Corindai, which is... Um, 
uh, very, very worrying to the people concerned, many of whom rely um, on the uh, Great Artesian Basin for water, for agriculture, and the risks that are known from coal seam gas and from the toxic um, salts that, that are distributed all around the, the place are, one, are two of the most compelling concerns for landowners and town dwellers as well. So what are our objectives? What were our, our objectives when we started? Well, um, we, they, this is what they were. We, we wanted to ground truth the impacts of coal mines and gas industry, um, which usually you hear about them in the form of an environmental impact assessment. And this has been conducted by experts and you see it in black and white, but you, never have any community participation in the gathering of that information. So ground truthing, it was important. Identifying impacts that are not captured in the environmental impact assessment, that's emerged to be one of the really important contributions that citizen science can make. Um, as we see environmental impact assessment being narrowed down progressively, not only the scope, but also um, the methodology. Um, we also announced when, when we first launched the lead forest research node that we saw our role as supporting regulators in their role. Now, some people, some academics and, and scholars have referred to this as a surrogate regulator role. And I don't go so far as to use that expression. And I'm sure that many regulators would view, would be quite offended uh, and probably it's improper, but um, it is a term that's in common usage now in um, the, the surrogate regulator. And to some extent, there is some truth in it in the, in the sense that the community has now been thrust into the role of becoming the compliance police. And I want people just to think about that, that we have paid regulators to do their roles. And some of them do to a, a lesser or greater extent really um, try to do that. But the reality is that the prosecutions that are occurring now against coal mines and the reporting of breaches, this is overwhelmingly occurring by virtue of the public um, making reports, <laughs> gathering information and data. And so that's a, a really important role that can't be denied. Um, we find that, um, that citizen science is strengthening advocacy through the use of data and science. Um, and we, we keep a watchful eye on them um, because we know that there is a motivation for them to cut corners and to save money. And um, so one thing about citizen science is that you don't just suddenly go, oh, I'm going to do some science. A lot of monitoring goes on in the course of developing what, what, what inquiry am I actually doing? What information do I need to obtain? So the, the design of the inquiry comes on the back of a lot of monitoring. Um, and um, so the other point is to build an alternative narrative for public discourse about the mining impacts and to frame people away from the negative terms of protester and activist um, which uh, I, I think we'll all agree, these are negative terminologies designed to, um, to portray um, anyone who doesn't agree with the mining as a sort of a fringe dweller, uh, a troublemaker, and so on. So the relevance of citizen science today, well, the, the relevance can be seen in proportion to the scale of this problem. And I mean, the scale, you've seen the map. So geographically, we have um, a large area, and not only the size of the area, but the significance of the area. The fact that, it, that this area is a food growing area, it's a food bowl. The fact that this is the, um, the, uh, the gas fields are on the recharge zone of the Great Artesian Basin. The fact that all these coal mines are operating in the catchment area of the Namoy, which is an important tributary of the Murray-Darling Basin and the damage that is going on in, uh, in, in digging down into aquifers and into, um, well, um, hydrogeological areas that are not well understood. At a global level, as we move away from fossil fuels and the value of the resource is declining, 
these companies will not hesitate to break conditions or cut corners to save money. And we see one of these situations playing out right now. It's quite a scandalous situation where the coal mines are seeking approval essentially to turn their landfills into their, sorry, their, their mines into landfills for mass tire burial in this day and age. Uh, and that's just one example that we see, and that's playing out at the moment. Um, th there's, the trust in post-approval compliance systems is very low and coal and gas are seen as bad neighbours by many. Um, they give selectively to, to numerous causes. You probably saw that um, uh, recently, that, well, all the time, there are different um, uh, news stories about the mines giving money here or there, but that doesn't manage to actually overcome the observed problems that they're causing in relation to um, water, groundwater loss of neighbours, pollution and other problems, some of which are the subject of uh, prosecutions and numerous other regulatory action. So the outcomes that we're looking for, well, we, we want to help redress the asymmetry of information and promote evidence-based decision making by regulators. Um, we seek to validate or, or alternatively to challenge the mines modelling. And we did that, we believe successfully in relation to, certainly in relation to noise uh, modelling um, at the Malls Creek mine. And um, that's an ongoing quest wherever possible. Um, we also um, believe that through our pollution pathway studies that we could be able to avert um, the formation of um, heavy metal accumulation sites occurring that will will result in legacy um, contaminated sites for the future generations to have to worry about and to clean up if possible. And we call for stricter compliance standards. And look, this is something that cannot be properly addressed in today's um, um, lunchtime seminar, but it is a, a fact that the compliance of these mines suffers a great deal due to a number of factors. Now, it's important to, to just tell people who are not aware that um, this area was the scene of a long running blockade called the Laird Blockade. Over 400 people were arrested in trying to stop the mine. So it can't be ignored that the Laird Forest Research Node is conducting citizen science in the wake of what essentially was a direct action blockade to stop the, the, these large mines from proceeding in the Laird Forest. I can obviously show you all the 400 people who were arrested, but just to give you an example of how broad was the community and, and how strong were the, um, you know, was the opposition, um, I'd like to pay a tribute to Bill Ryan, um, for example, who passed away last year. Bill Ryan, a World War II veteran of the Kokoda track. Um, he was arrested at the Malls Creek coal mine and he always said to us, I, I went to fight for our democracy and I went to fight to protect our country and, and I'm fighting again now, but I'm fighting on our own soil against these coal mines. We had people like a former... DPP solicitor, prosecutor, Marion Rose, who locked on to the Whitehaven pump at the Namoy River. We had the traditional tree sits um, in the forest, basically putting themselves in the path of bulldozers at the Malls Creek mine. And so this was a highly contested kind of situation whereby um, the community was, um, uh, well, there, there was some concern in the community that outsiders were coming in and they were going to disrupt things and, you know, they were hippies and there was a lot of this misinformation. And there was also a, a, a sabotage that was conducted by people and attributed to, um, uh, to, to protesters and so on. But then um, things started to change. So... 
before the Laird Forest Research Node had started, there had already been some citizen science conducted at the Laird, which was highly successful. This was the discovery of Tylophora linearis by the Greenpeace Threatened Species Protection Unit. Now, Tylophora linearis is a small vine, which is um, it, it's a, a threatened species listed by the Commonwealth, and it was omitted from the um, the, the Moles Creek um, appro approval. Sorry, it was omitted from their. Um, um, environmental impact assessment, and it was not listed as one of the matters of national environmental significance that was um, at risk at the mine. And here's a picture of it. And they went out there and over 100 plants were found which had not been disclosed to the Commonwealth. Now, the result of that was that the company, oh, well, they went and they had to... Um, they, they then had to change their environmental assessment and they had to undertake a program of, of planting this, this um, endangered um, plant. But the trouble is that um, in the end, the offsets were not fully, um, the offset strategy wasn't adhered to. And even one of their mine owned areas, which does have Tylophora linearis, is threatened by a future expansion to the north anyway. So, there were good outcomes from, from that, which was that it really did inspire people to look at evidence and do field work like that. Um, but the negative was that we saw that it was going to be like trench warfare to ever get that science listened to or to ever get any kind of regulatory change. Nevertheless, in the early days, we were hopeful. Our first expose was atmospheric temperature readings monitoring the temperature at the time of clearing. Now, this picture shows you what it looks like when the mine enters its clearing window and you can see how they have devastated um, many hectares of, of the Laird State Forest. And um, what we knew from the Biodiversity Management Plan was that there were some rules around the timing and procedures that they could clear. Um, the wording was the clearing of understory and tree filling, including habitat trees, will be halted if the temperature exceeds 35 degrees. So we monitored the temperature on the clearing days and we used a combination of handheld thermometers as close as we could get to the clearing site, which you cannot go immediately to the clearing site without trespassing. Uh, and also we monitored all the weather stations in the area very closely. Now, it happened that in the mid-February, it's very hot in Narrabri, and on the days concerned, we had no weather station showing anything less than, certainly anything less than 35, and very often one or two degrees more. Um, we, co we collected all those records. We, we, we made formal complaints and we found that the process was really lacking. And it was really lacking because partly because the regulator said to us, well, they've told us that it was not more than 35 degrees. And when we said, well, well have you got their actual like records from their weather station? And they said to us, oh, no, no, we, we can't get that. That's management information only. What? Yeah, well, this is a common problem. <laughs> um, they did eventually manage to investigate it and only through launching an investigation, they were able to get some information that denied that it was over 35 degrees. Well, you know, you have to ask how it could be that every other weather station in the area was over 35 degrees. The whole region is baking hot, but only there. It was under 35 degrees. And I'll leave that question with you. It's a question that we have all the time. So one of the really great things that was also done in 2014 and 2015 was that we conducted um, baseline surveys of the bird life um, and produced some reports. Um, we had some... Uh, we had some really interesting um, results from the bird surveys. 
Um, you know, we, we had um, even in one morning 82 species observed um, with six vulnerable species under the New South Wales Threatened Species Act. Um, all of our survey teams included at least one expert or highly experienced birder to ensure that the um, statistics, that the data was robust. And, and what we found was that citizen science in the forest performs multiple roles. Uh, it's great. It's very exciting to have experts um, to learn from. And it really, the other side observations that you make while doing it and the building an accumulation of knowledge and familiarity is, um, it, it is a cumulative thing. So we conducted these bird surveys and we, um, we are going to, we're planning to do a repeat of them later this year. So just letting people know, anyone wants to get involved, we are going to attempt to do a repeat of the, um, the same bird surveys that we did. And we're going to use the same, well, we were going to use the same locations. Except for, one, oh, I'll just go back just to show you. Um, so back then when we did our survey, we nevertheless noticed that Bogger Bryke Hull's Southern Rehabilitation Report was saying that already only two years after the expansion of that mine, um, that they were reporting a low diversity of threatened woodland birds had been recorded in the rehabilitated areas. So that was already the situation. And I can tell you, it's a whole lot worse now. Um, we also did some other outreach. So for example, we took advantage of what we, what we were learning and we created children's worksheets um, of the, uh, the endangered birds of the Laird. And that was um, a, something really beautiful, extending it to children because children can't easily be involved in some of our citizen science activities. Our plans to repeat the bird surveys, well, they've somewhat been compromised at the moment. Um, here you can see this was our different areas that we surveyed or some of them on that side of the forest. Uh, but, da -da, well, just in April, we happened to be in the forest and we see some signs have been put up and this is the sign that's gone up. The area in red that you see here, this has now been turned into a, um, an exclusive use area for the Bogabri mine. Now the Bogabri mine told the Community Consultative Committee, we didn't ask for it. Uh, New South Wales Forestry said, well, we've decided to create this exclusive use area because of the dangers if people venture there because of the fumes coming from the mine when they're blasting. So please, people, think about that. If that is too dangerous for the humans to go there during the, um, you know, when there's blasting, mm -hmm. how safe is it for all those animals and the threatened species that, that used to live there? Well, um, there are quite a few issues about the um, ongoing um, uh, encroachment on the forest um, and one of them as I put in the notes here is one of the problems is that the analog sites that were set up originally to be the comparison sites for rehabilitation well guess what they've been taken up by mining so they have to move the analog sites there's no transparency around the analog sites and also no transparency around the trigger action response plans. And if there's no transparency around them, then you have to really wonder what, how, how well they're being complied with at all. Today, very little animal life can be seen in the Laird Forest. And it's really sad. You go there once upon a time, there was bird song, there were animals, there were reptiles and so on. Um, the picture you're looking at now, was Lawless Well. Now, Lawless Well was um, a culturally significant site of the Gomeroy, as you can imagine. Thousands of artefacts were found there when they surveyed. A spring fed waterhole in the Laird Forest, it was the only permanent uh, water supply for the animals. Well, unfortunately, that was in the path of Whitehaven Coles Moles Creek Mine, and that has now been bulldozed. Um, we we believe actually that the water that 
has been in, the spring has been intercepted by the mine because water pours into the mine from that area near where that is. Um, so that was um, a, a really sad thing that happened, um, and it's had an impact on on the um, on the wildlife. We believe now um, regular blasting leads to strong vibrations, particulate pollution, and in some cases, NO2 incidence, which is toxic to humans. Uh, I just wanted to give people a little bit of an idea of what it looks like when... And what you're looking at actually is a double blast. You can see that there's been a blast to the left, a large one, and a small one over to the right. Now, that noise is not the noise of the blast, but nevertheless, I wanted to show to people to see just how severe this blasting looks from a distance of about seven kilometres. And I'd also like to point out I think that gives you a bit of a picture of what it's like to be even seven kilometres from a blast like that, and that's happening to you every week. It's it's pretty severe. Um, this was viewed from Harper Airy Road, um, which is where the little school is. And, you know, it seems incredible that this is tolerated, that this blasting can be going on near a school, well, even near people's homes, and yet it is. And you question the birds, the bats, the koalas, what impact is it on them to have this kind of um, blast? And this is not just one blast a week. This is several blasts a week from multiple places. Oh, sorry. So then the other thing that started to become apparent from the very early days of the operations of the, the mines was the noise disturbance from the Malls Creek mine far beyond where the 35 decibel noise limit was supposed to be. The locals soon experienced noise from the Malls Creek mine. They were experiencing um, uh, sleep disturbance and um, you could actually hear distinct noises from over eight kilometres distance. Well, you know, when the background noise is, when the background noise levels are only about 25 decibels, that's what you get. You get noise from toots. You could hear the toot. You could hear the tractor tread slap and you could hear rocks being dumped in, in the trays. And we, we, were, we were encouraged because we'd heard about community in um, Port Botany having success in analysing the noise levels from the container terminal. What had happened was that Port Botany residents had complained of sleep criteria breaches from the container term, terminal, the EPA set up monitoring equipment and concluded that there was no increase in noise levels. The sceptical residents asked for the raw technical data, analysed it themselves and found errors and insisted that the EPA redo its analysis. Well, we found that really encouraging, but unfortunately, we weren't able to have that much success as the people of Port Botany. Um, we also were encouraged by developments in citizen science that were new technology was becoming available. So there was generally a sense that we could achieve something. Um, and um, so we bought an entry level acoustic monitor. It was only about $400. It validated the lived experience of what people were complaining about. And then we crowdfunded to buy a $6,000 um, class one acoustic meter that could be used. Um, it could be, uh, it, it would be more um, something that they would listen to more, shall we say. You needed to have that anyway to comply with the industrial noise policy. And, uh, and so there, then we started two years of winter monitoring. And that was, uh, you know, it's not for the faint hearted doing this kind of monitoring. You're out at night, um, you, you're out 
on cold nights in winter, you are, um, you know, you're being trailed by mine security. Sorry, I'm just trying to progress my slideshow here. Mm, ah. So our first lead forest noise report in September 2015, well, um, we... We found that people were not always complaining because sometimes there'd be one person in the family severely upset about it, the other one didn't notice it so much. Low frequency noise is like that. It can depend on the, the your, your physiology, uh, it, different uh, chest cavity size, all kinds of different things can affect um, whether the low frequency noise is going to disturb you or not. Um, and our report found, knowing that the true original background noise in the area was likely to have been well under 30 decibels and approaching 25 decibels, to call an increase of up to 10 to 13 decibels as a mild impact, that of a 13 to 15 decibels as moderate, is simply untruthful, not to mention scientific. But you see, um, it the grinding, uh, you know, challenges of demonstrating this continued. Um, we spent a night in observing the mine and correlating it with noise that we were picking up with our monitors so that we could match, for example, the sound of equipment um, with a particular frequency. Um, and we also produced a number of complaints and, and reports. Now, I'd just like to bring attention to this slide because this is where you really get into the nitty gritty of the citizen science um, and the challenges of citizens when you are coming up against experts. So we obtained through the Government Information Public Access, which is also known as Freedom of Information, we obtained some really interesting documents about what the experts and the bureaucrats were saying about us. Um, so, for example, it says, I just had a phone call from X, and I, I believe X was me, via the environment line. X had my name from when we met with them at their request and with the agreement of Malls Creek Coal Mine to discuss good acoustic practice in relation to noise monitoring. Question. Why should the EPA, why should the regulator seek the agreement of Moores Creek Coal Mine to discuss good acoustic practice with the community? And therein we have behind the scenes discussions, you know, that was to us improper for them to be discussing and even the words to seek the agreement of Moores Creek Coal Mine. Um, and also, the EPA did not propose to apply an approach simply because it, the outcome was preferred by one group or another, but based instead on the best science available. And look, this is something we hear now from Santos, we hear from the Department of Health, we're going to choose the experts we listen to. Well, you know something, we actually had evidence. So look over to your right, because it happened that on one night, we were doing noise monitoring the same night that Global Acoustics, Whitehaven Coles consultants were doing it, and we found extremely anomalous results. We had these, these results. This is the low frequency. Look how high the low frequency is. They were saying that they were under 30 decibels, and this, we, uh, we couldn't even get that amount because they won't disclose it. So we were faced with us having four readings that we would fully disclose and hand up all of our charts and graphs. They had two readings, which they wouldn't disclose. Even then, they would only accept the mine's um, opinion. Now, this was really highly problematic at the time. Um, and we wrote a, a, a very serious complaint to the EPA. Unfortunately, time is moving on. I don't have time to, to tell you the full story about that. but. Um, uh, to suffice to say that um, we, we really challenged them as hard as we could because what we were finding was that the noise levels that were supposed to be contained within the red line were ex being exceeded way, way beyond 
that. And um, yet still the Department of Planning kept insisting, despite all of the evidence, that the noise um, in a rural environment would only, it would only extend to four kilometres um, at the maximum, um, uh, the maximum decibels. So, well, um, Pat, shall I talk more about th this noise stuff or just give more of a flavour and deal with the noise later? Because, I mean, I, of course we love our topic, um, <laughs> but here I'll just take that as a move on. Um, this is an example of the kind of dust pollution that you get in the area. And when you complain, you get the answer from the mine that, oh, well, there was a big dust storm somewhere else and or the farmers are ploughing. Um, and we've heard some ridiculous ones. We've even heard the, the mine complain that the forest can, is causing the dust, which is scientifically incorrect because actually forests absorb dust. Um, but there was a breakthrough. Now, this was a terrific breakthrough that the New South Wales EPA installed a real-time camera on a private property near the Malls Creek mine. It was, um, it was a terrific breakthrough because it enabled the EPA based in Armadale to actually see what was going on. Up until then, it was the community's word against Whitehaven Coal. And you've seen with the noise example how hopeless that is to try for the community to be trying to compete with Whitehaven Coal. Um, subsequently, that property was, was bought out. The real-time camera moved to the state conservation area as it's been inoperative for the best part of the year. And now if you make a complaint about dust, well, they deny it and then there's no evidence because the camera's not working. So that's pretty bad. But nevertheless, dust was obviously a big problem in the area. And, and I will add that there's a, big, there's a dust problem in Tamworth, which we claim needs some further analysis because the prevailing northwesterly wind will be taking dust straight to Tamworth. And Tamworth does have a kind of horseshoe ring of, of mountains around it. Um, the EPA has always responded to this with the, the argument that it's the wood fire smoke that's causing it. But even in summer, they claim that it's the wood fire smoke. And we believe that um, some kind of broader study needs to be done to see how far afield the, um, the dust from these mines is going, because there is a possibility that it's actually going and causing dust pollution at Tamworth. Basically, um, when we did our own dust deposition monitoring at Malls Creek, which we did after a very detailed study of the whole geography and the environmental conditions and different land ownership in the area, we found the system to be farcical. We actually replicated a system of dust deposition which is used by the mines. They're obligated to do it under the conditions. But I'll tell you right now, it measures, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to be measuring because all it does is measure how much dust is falling. It doesn't tell you the chemical composition of it. You don't know where the dust has come from. And it's this kind of meaningless study that needs to now um, be looked into because it's actually stopping people from doing more meaningful studies that might apportion responsibility for the dust problem to a particular industry and also um, studies that will actually ascertain what is the chemical composition. Now, one of the big challenges that we have being a broad based group is learning to use the instruments in the field. And that takes up a lot of time. So you might have to hire an instrument for a, a, a few days just to learn to use it and then have to postpone your, your material studies till later. And so that's a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of time spent just doing that. Um, out in the field, practice runs, anemometer, cross-checking. Here we are using um, the dust meter, practicing using the dust meter in preparation for doing a 24-hour study at the Bob Bry station. And we used that just by driving a car backwards and forwards to look at how, um, how the readings would go up and down. Um, 
So learning the geography is also critical to um, the study design and interpretation of environmental impact assessments. Um, at the 2018 um, Australian Citizen Science Association conference, Emily Vanderstock, one of our members, presented her, her study on foliar deposition of um, dust near the Mills Creek coal mine uh, across a transect. You can see this transect that was created and tomato seedlings were planted and um, they were collected. And the results of that were, were, were um, that basically the closer you get to the mine, the dust greatly increases. So claims from the Mills Creek coal mine that the dust is coming from elsewhere were strongly refuted by that study. So we do have a lot of mapping challenges. Um, we have maps in different formats. Um, we have difficulty of comparing. It's great that now GIS technology is the solution because you can now, uh, we now have the ability to uh, overlay different maps of different origins. Um, there are legal issues if you don't get your mapping right because trespass is a serious thing. Um, nighttime trespass is potentially dangerous. There are people with guns out there, pig shooters, landowners trying to keep pig shooters out. Um, and so even on some occasions, I will do a, a check of tenure the day before field work just to ensure that there are no changes to, to that. And here is a picture from our 24-hour ambient air monitoring exercise at Bogabri Railway Station. Um, fairly grueling um, and we, um, we've discovered huge variations with uh, mainly with the locomotives. Um, the PM 2.5 uh, emissions from the locomotives, uh, there was one occasion where uh, one of those locos was 2,000 times the emissions. Um, we knew that the locomotives, the diesel emissions were a problem, but we had no idea that, that were, they were going to be that much. Um, so um, that, that was a learning experience. We haven't repeated it. Um, and here we are at the Bogabri station. There was a lot of community involvement in the whole dust um, program, people helping set up um, the monitors in their homes and wanting to learn about the results. Um, one of our really sad but important um, events was a biodiversity rapid assessment of the lead traveling stock route in July 2017. And this is an issue that is playing out right now. Here we had a group of environmental science and ecology students who um, came along and participated in this rapid assessment. As you can see, this traveling stock route contains um, habitat trees, they're already marked. Here's a view of the traveling stock route before it got bulldozed. And this is critically endangered ecological community, white box grassy woodland of a high quality. It was linked to the Laird Forest until the mine got in the middle. And um, that is a drone view of what it looked like beforehand. Um, we entered through an open gate. We didn't trespass. We sought approval from the Gomeroy. We, in, we informed um, um, the Gomeroy um, elders before we went in there and we asked if anyone could accompany us, but it, it just wasn't possible on the day. We walked through an open door and we went in and we um, did this survey. Um, this is now where Whitehaven wants to bury thousands of tonnes of tyres and they're currently seeking approval from, um, well, well, they haven't applied for it yet but because first they're trying to get landowners' consent from the Gomeroy to do that. Um, but this is the kind of um, thing that we're up against the whole time. You can see in this image here, this large area, which we call an overburden dump or... Um, well, it's the overburden, um, that lies where the travelling stock route used to be, which is pretty awful. Um, another scene where we have been doing quite a bit of um, work has been at the Pilliger East. 
And this is some footage of some of the activities going on courtesy of the Narrabri Underground Coal Mine. Until we started investigating what's going on there, I don't think anyone had any idea of how severe the above ground footprint of an underground coal mine can be. But that's how it is when you're Whitehaven coal and you decide that you're going to, you've got a, you've just got a forest that you can do what you like with on the surface. Um, this activity that we're looking here um, appears to be a some uh, a setting up of a degassing station. Um, you can see quite a bit of mess there and um, drilling rigs and so on. Um, this is multiplied many, many times throughout the forest, creating severe fragmentation, pollution, residue pollution, and um, also fugitive emissions because you've got um, raw venting of gases from the coal seams. Um, and so um, we, this, here's another picture from, from the Narrabri, um, from, from um, Pilliga Forest, where we've done some work. Um, I'll just interrupt first. This is what you don't do. This is an improperly capped borehole, which we found. Um, the company is being prosecuted. Any day now, we're going to hear what the sentence is. Um, this is not how you take samples, but I'm showing it to you because it's one of the rare pictures that we've got of how Whitehaven left an uncapped borehole um, in the Pilliga Forest, and that's one of the that's one of the um, offences that they've been charged with. Um, and what's wrong with this whole picture here is that um, the samples are not in ice and the guy doesn't have a glove on and there's no preservative. I'm not showing I'm not showing this to you as a demonstration of good science practice. It's um, this is just an example of us having some um, you know empty jars we thought we'll take out. We weren't really prepared, but look what we found. Um, this is how you do it the right way. <laughs> I just thought I'd show you. Um, bottles with preservative kept packed in ice and so on. Um, and that's how we've been doing it for our pollution pathways um, water testing which we've got some pilot studies which we're planning to build on. We have discovered some accumulation sites that, that we've identified and work is ongoing. More recently, one of the latest um, examples of citizen science is called Gaswatch, uh, and that's been done with the um, Northwest Protection Advocacy Group, um, which is primarily a group that has been established to um, monitor the gas expansion. Um, and Gas Watch, um, we created a, a booklet, a field inspection booklet to enable members of the public to go and safely have a look at what's going on in the gas fields and how to interpret what's going on there and how to report back. And it was a collaboration between uni students and a wide range of um, community members. So what are some of the risks and challenges? Well, safety of researchers is, is paramount. This photo might look like we're taking a big risk by standing in close proximity to the blast, but what you don't see is that the car was basically right behind us because we know that NO2 fumes can cause permanent harm um, and, and, and we, you know, we, we take our own safety very carefully, very seriously because... Um, we, our reputational risk would, would be too great if people got injured um, or if we do any kind of unlawful activity or reckless appearing activity. Um, other risks and challenges, well, there's harassment by mine security. Um, and also previously, we, we did used to be harassed by police. And I will point out that we no longer are harassed by police. And um, the mines did try to... Um, they tried to defame people. They tried to allege to the police that people were doing illegal activities. After crying wolf one too many times, the police actually stopped listening to Whitehaven Coal, which was great. 
And trust building is one of the really important things that you need to do when you're involved in citizen science. Here we have pictures of what it's like. It is a bit dangerous, I will say. They, uh, there have been some moments where they have really acted irresponsibly, the, the um, security. Here they are in the video tailing us uh, when we're just going about our lawful business. Um, they seem to think that's that's okay, and um, and I'd just like to point out to people before I close that um, one of our important sources of information and monitoring is in is by air and not by drone because the Malls Creek mine we cannot view them by drone partly due to it's not legal to unless you're licensed to have a drone outside of your um, uh, you have, it has to be within your eyesight. Um, but flights like this are really, really valuable, and we do these regularly. So this is a view of um, the, the Malls Creek mine, and um, it's these kind of it's these kind of um, flights that have really been so important in informing us about what's going on behind closed doors, shall we say. And here I'd like to, I've got a message from one of our beautiful members. Hi, my name is Maria. Um, we're in the Pilliga Forest um, at the moment and I'm a volunteer for the Laird Forest Research Node and I encourage others, um, if, if possible, if you could join us because Citizen science is going to be an, um, important, in the, extremely important in the future, ensuring that um, mining companies are kept accountable and to ensure that they, they comply with, with the regulations and the terms and conditions of their operations. That's really... So, um, and I would like to thank you. That ends my presentation.